This is FRM Part 1, Book 1, Foundations of Risk Management, and the chapter on Enterprise Risk Management and Future Trends. I want to start with an analogy. It might not be a perfect analogy, but it's a, a much more fascinating example than what's provided in the chapter. I want you to think about uh, all of the risk to which Indiana Jones was exposed in those four movies. Hopefully you're old enough to have watched them. Probably not like I did when they were released, but hopefully you've seen them over the years. Think of the risks that Indiana Jones faced. You know, he was almost uh, bitten by snakes. He was almost bitten by rats. He was almost... Uh, decapitated on a boat. Um, he almost was rolled over by the that big boulder in the very first movie. In the second movie, there was that gushing water and he had to go out on the edge uh, of a mountain. Sometimes he used his uh, muscles and his strength to get out of those, uh, to avoid those risks. Sometimes he used his brain, like in that very first movie when he was, uh, when he was tied to the pole and he decided to close his eyes when they, uh, when they opened up the, uh, uh, that golden housing that was supposed to uh, hold uh, uh, the Ten Commandments. So anyway, you know, you think about this. Indiana Jones could have been killed or maimed in almost any one of those instances. But what did he have to protect him? He had Steven Spielberg, the director, who operated like an enterprise risk manager. And what I want to do is I want to skip ahead to a couple of slides here. So look at this. Uh, you know, before we even talk about ERM, here are these risks over here that we've spent the first handful of chapters in book one talking about, right? Credit risk, operational risk. We did, we did all that stuff. But think about if we have an umbrella to protect against those risks, that sometimes the rain or the snow or the wind uh, or the fire, whatever it is coming down that is uh, increasing each of those individual risks, we only have the individual umbrellas to protect us. So if Indiana Jones was staring face to face at that cobra snake, he probably would have gotten bitten. But skip over to the right. What did he? He had Steven Spielberg as the director holding this umbrella over the entire movie set, so that so that Harrison Ford was in no danger of the the rats or the or the snake or the fire when he was underneath that church trying to find the uh, the tomb of uh, of Sir William. We'll get back to the slide here in just a second. All right, so in going through these learning objectives, there's a really fascinating paragraph at the, at the beginning of this chapter. And I'm going to do something just a little bit unusual. Uh, I didn't put it on a slide because I want you to pay attention here. You ready for this? This is why we're doing this. Helps firm manage risk efficiently. Boy, that's really important, efficiently. Identify overlooked enterprise risks. Oh, so there are risks that we don't know about. Do you remember there were politicians that said something, oh, this is in the early 2000s, you know, there's the known knowns and the unknown unknowns and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's what we're talking about here. Manage risk concentrations. Oh my gosh, we're going to talk about that at length in here. And understand how different types of risks interact with each other. So we need to bring in the specter of things like correlation coefficients, maybe maybe even value at risk, maybe those uh, marginal distributions, and then the copulas that we'll talk about later on. And so that pretty, sum, that pretty much summarizes what these learning objectives are going, to, uh, are going to look like. You know, let me go ahead and read a couple of these to you. Describe ERM. Well, I'm kind of giving you a sense there. Indiana Jones, motivations will do those. And we spend lots of time on best practices on how to manage not just risks, but to uh, be good leaders inside of these businesses. We do talk regularly uh, in book one about a risk culture, so we'll do a little bit about that, and then scenario analysis will finish up. So I'm guessing you can visualize this Steven Spielberg as the overall arching umbrella. So what is what is uh, ERM? When you when you look at the reading, you'll you'll see words that sound like uh, firm wide. 
uh, top-down, uh, holistic approaches. All right, so strategic management of risk from the perspective, perspective of the organization as a whole. So, of course, Steven Spielberg, being the director of these movies, he knows exactly what's going to happen, you know, before it happens. So think of him as that umbrella. There we go, top-down strategy. So what do I say to you guys regularly? You know, this is Jim's, uh, Jim's risk management principles. Identify the risks, quantify the risks, and then manage the risk. And of course, different authors and, and different kinds of professionals, you know, they couch in different kinds of terminology. So this reading, identify the risk, assessing, so that's quantifying, preparing for potential losses. So that's all part of my words for manage, uh, managing the risks. And then of course, look at that third block point, takes into account the interrelationships between an among various risks. Ah, it differs from the traditional silos. I'll do that here in just a second here. And then what this allows Steven Spielberg to do is to manage the risks inside of and outside of the silos with these different spheres of responsibility. You know, the, the chapter gives you a pretty good lesson, uh, history lesson on this ERM. And it it, it tends to begin or identify the beginning somewhere in the 1970s. And it's my opinion that this probably goes way and way back. I mean, those of you who have families know that, you know, let's suppose you have, you know, five or six or 10 children and a husband or wife, you know, what you do is you try to make decisions that are best for the family. You don't want to make decisions that are best for, you know, little Johnny, because that might not be in the best interest of the rest of the family. But anyway, this history lesson, I think, is interesting because it, it identifies the early 1970s, but it doesn't mention the switch from the gold standard to floating exchange rates. And I think this is probably the, the big event that occurred in the early 1970s because it introduced exchange rate volatility, which then, of course, introduced volatility into global bond prices and stock prices and all those other kinds of prices, which then directly led into financial engineering because, you know, there are really smart men and women in 1973 that said something like, oh, if we're going to have all this volatility, how about these derivative contracts to help manage that volatility? And then the little history lesson says something like, you know what, in the 80s and the 90s, lots of commercial banks then started identifying the need for this risk culture. And they said, you know what, we probably need a chief risk officer. And so most banks these days, I mean, I think all large banks have have one of these men or women as their as their chief risk officer. But then it expanded out into larger corporations and it continues to expand downward to medium and small sized corporations. And so my point of all this little lesson is that, you know, it's an evolution. You know, we started, you know, let's say you know, 40 years ago or however long that's been, but I think it goes way, way back to the to the family unit. But but clearly we're evolving as uh, ERM experts. So back to this slide here, notice that the umbrella on the right hand side is a larger and a bigger, think of it as the golf umbrella. You know, you ever watch uh, the British Open? I know there was one, oh, I don't know, this is probably 10 years ago, and Tiger Woods is out there, you know, and it's windy and it's raining and he's got this umbrella and all of a sudden, it, you know, it, uh, it turns upside down. Um, that's, of course, what happened in the 2008 financial crisis, even though risk managers were aware of all of this stuff and the importance of ERM. It hasn't been perfect, but as we'll see that after the 2008 financial crisis, that uh, it's become even more solid. Uh, we'll see that in a couple of slides. So I think it's helpful to understand that the silo based management on the left hand side of this slide, you know, this is uh, outdated, it's archaic, it's obsolete, and it leads to, well, what did I say earlier, the unknown unknowns or the unknown knowns or whatever, whatever that terminology is. Now, here's a bird's eye illustration of a commercial bank. And so think about here, let me just go back here real quick. So think about, you know, all of these individual risks, which of course 
uh, exist inside of all of these different silos. So you think about, you know, think about deposit accounts and operations and trading. You know, think about all these as the bird's eye view. But notice as the bird's eye view, we're not looking at them as individual silos. We're looking at them like the bird's eye view. Boy, who was the guy who uh, who developed the bird's eye view? Wasn't that uh, Hitchcock in those famous movies? I sure hope you watch some of those uh, those old time old time movies with the bird's eye view. And so you get a picture. You know, you get a firm wide picture, right? You get a you get an holistic view of what's going on. And so what are some words that we've highlighted over there in the bullet points? Integrated risk management framework. I mean, look, when you're looking down at the credit silo, you know, out of the corner of your eye, you can see the trading silo. So you got to see that integration. And of course, the first step in the integration is is a correlation coefficient, which we talk about at length here uh, in future chapters. Managing risks across business units. Okay, so we're doing this, we're between and among and all that kind of stuff. And then the, the, the human link, you know, the, uh, the management link comes from everybody who's in charge, the individuals who in char are in charge of each of those silos, and they can't have, they can't have tunnel vision. Now, let me use my example for the credit and the trading. So clearly these are two different silos, right? And they're gonna require two different areas of expertise. And so we probably need two different kinds of metrics to evaluate performance. But let's swing back to those senior managers. Let's swing back to the board of directors with the establishment of a risk appetite and we're probably going to come up with some kind of a model, some kind of a metric, some kind of a statistic that is, are you ready for this? Unique to each one of those, but also can be applied cross-sectionally. So look at the very bottom. We say a firm, wide picture of the risks. All right, this is probably a really good exam question. Let's go ahead and compare these two. And um, for this one here, I want to go ahead and switch over to, you know, the Indiana Jones example. I, I think it's a good one, but it's, you know, kind of fantasy world. Uh, let's switch over to a company that we all know. How about Johnson & Johnson? You know, uh, Johnson & Johnson has essentially three product lines, three different silos. You know, it has the, uh, you know, the personal hygiene stuff, right? What do we do? You know, we we use their Listerine, we we use their Band-Aids, we we bathe our babies in the sink with uh we, you know with Johnson's baby shampoo. And then it has it has its devices, you know, so I could I could uh, I, I have a Johnson and Johnson artificial hip. Well, one of the cool things about Johnson and Johnson, not only do they make the they make the artificial hips, but you know, we're adults here. Can I go ahead and say something here? Adult themed, you know, when, when you have a hip replacement, you know, they have to kind of, you know, saw off the top of your leg bone. So Johnson and Johnson makes the saws. You can go to its webpage and you can see the saws. I mean, I, I didn't want to do that before my operation, but I, I could look at it after the operation. And then they have all the other, you know, I guess it's called pharmaceutical division where they do, you know, the COVID stuff and, uh, um, cancer treatment and all that kind of stuff. So think of those as three silos. And at, at first glance, you might not think that, boy, there's any positive correlations, but let me just give you a silly example here. You know, what happens? Uh, many of us went and got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, uh, when COVID hit in 2020 or whenever whenever it was released. And so just think about it. So you get the, you get the vaccine and what does the, what does the nurse do? They, you know, they swab it, they stick it into your arm and they put a Band-Aid on it. So Procter & Gamble, here's silo over here with, you know, with the vaccine. And then here's a silo over here with the Band-Aids. And so, boy, there's got to be some kind of a correlation that is impacting the individual risks, but then the, but then the cross risks. All right. So think about Johnson & Johnson when you're answering a question on the exam about the difference between the two. All right, so let me just quickly do this here. I, I think this, I think you'll know this. So risks are viewed within the lines of businesses, right? In isolation. Uh, maybe there are risk metrics that don't really make sense. I mean, what are we going to do? Are we going to calculate 
uh, let's say a standard deviation of Band-Aid operating cash flows, standard deviation of COVID vaccinations. I mean, you can calculate those too, but they might not have a whole lot of uh, comparability because other than the basic statistic stuff, standard deviation of one might not be related to the standard deviation of the other. So that's why we have incomparable risk metrics. Yeah, risk aggregation is mostly absent. You guys remember learning about, uh, well, I don't know where you would learn this, maybe in an economics class, maybe in a finance class, where sometimes things are additive and sometimes things are multiplicative. Is that the right word? Multiplicative? Sounds good. Um, and so you need to make certain that you know how to aggregate risks. So you can't add the standard deviation of Band-Aids and the standard deviation of uh, vaccinations against COVID. You can't add those two and get, oh, there's some kind of uh, aggregate standard deviation. Yeah, each risk type is managed using specific risk transfer instruments. Yeah, so this is really cool. Think about the Band-Aids and how are we going to transfer that risk? Think about COVID. How are we going to transfer that risk? Well, that transfer agent, you know, might be completely different. Someone might be perfectly willing to insure, maybe an insurance company, maybe a derivative contract with the Band-Aids, but with the COVID vaccines, you know, there's all sorts of legal issues there. So. I'm not quite sure how that works. Yeah, it cannot be integrated. All right, so let's go over to uh, the ERP, uh, uh, the ERM side. Boy, risks are viewed across business lines, right? Every every kind of cross-sectionality that you can think of, you're going to evaluate those risks. It's all integrated, cross-risk, universal metrics, integrated frameworks, multi-trigger instruments, and integrating balance sheet, capital management, financing strategies. Uh, that's super important, that, that last one, especially especially for banks, as we're going to see in a future slide here in just a few minutes about, uh, you know, let's just call it tier one capital. What's that tier one capital? So that's, you know, mostly common stock. It might include some reserves out there, but, you know, those oftentimes are limited. So you just think about that tier one capital and how all of these, here, let me go back here just quickly here. All of these risks are going to impact that tier one capital. Well, if you're operating on the traditional method on the left hand side, you know, you're coming from all of these different angles and that capital, when it's exposed to all that uncertainty is going to, you know, it's going to shrink. On the other hand, if we have this big umbrella, then we're in a better sense of being able to protect the firm. All right, I'm guessing that you would know uh, all of these benefits just based on our conversation. There's the bird's eye view. Think of Hitchcock. Uh, allows the upper executive leadership team to concentrate on the organization's largest threats. You know, let me just go back to this one here. You know, in this example here, it looks like those five umbrellas on the left are about the same size of an umbrella, but you know as well as I do that, uh, you know, sometimes market risk is a huge umbrella. Sometimes operational risk is, uh, doesn't need as big an umbrella. Yeah, I love this one here uh, from a defensive approach to a strategic offensive tool. Boy, this has tremendous applications in the sports world. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm a big critic of those football coaches who have the lead. They're up by less than a touchdown. The other team punts. There's three and a half minutes to go. And the coach says, all right, let's hand off. Let's hand off. Let's hand off. And then we'll punt and we'll allow our defense to try to win the game. And most times the defense isn't capable of doing it and they lose. Uh, and that, that drives me crazy. So when what these coaches ought to do, when they get the ball, all they need is one or two first downs and the game is over. You win the game right there. And so that's exactly what ERM is suggesting. You know, I like this next one here, better control over emerging risks, because if you have, here, let me go back here. If you have this bird's eye view and you're looking at each one of the silos and how they are interconnected, well, of course, what you're doing is you're going to be able to see how those risks evolve and you're going to be able to identify 
those emerging risks much better. You know, what are what are some of these? So cyber threats, you know, I mean, that's huge. You guys know that better than I do, probably. Uh, reputation risks. I always go and tell my students to, uh, especially my students in the advanced corporate finance class, I have an assignment where I say, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and type, do a search, type in McDonald's and type in uh, chief executive officers over the last decade. And uh, uh, so they do this research. And then we have a conversation in class about why McDonald's last two uh, CEOs were let go. And we talk about the different kinds of reasons and the different kinds of individuals. And so reputation risk, that's super important. All right, crossover risks, we talked about that. Regulatory compliance, we always talk about the need for a compliance department. Um, you know, we don't need to be, we don't need to be lawyers, but we need to have colleagues who are lawyers who, who know all of this stuff. Yeah, I like this next one here. Risk transfer expenses are optimized based on that risk scale. And, and, you know, not just total costs, but of course, marginal costs. We gotta evaluate marginal costs and marginal benefits. Helps firm to model capital costs. What do we know? What's the goal of any business is to maximize shareholder wealth. How do we do that? Well, one way to do that is to minimize the weighted average cost of capital. And so this ERM is going to identify paths, you know, on the right hand side of the balance sheet so that we can minimize that cost of capital, then maximizing firm value. And then swing back to the board of director level. And this this bird's eye view, uh, uh, this ERM is going to allow the board to be able to say something like, all right, here we are. We're 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 Johnson and Johnson. We've done all of this research on COVID. Let's go ahead and identify potentially the next virus that's out there or the next three viruses that are out there. And let's make sure that we're prepared for it. And that'll help us identify those appropriate business models. All right, best practices. So let's go ahead and still use the umbrella analogy. So think of the board of directors as, you know, the, 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 uh, the umbrella, holding the umbrella and all the material in the umbrella. And so what does the board do? They establish the risk appetite. We talked about that in, uh, in previous chapters. And, and what does that mean? That essentially establishes uh, some kind of a system or a process under which all of the, at least the upper uh, executive team knows that the board says something like this. And how about if I simplify it? You know, don't ever tell your stats professors that I did this, that the board says, look, this is how much risk that we're comfortable with, you know, whatever that is and, and how we're gonna measure it. And, you know, sometimes there are board members who know how to measure this risk, but a lot of times the board members, they understand it, but they're not quite sure how to measure it. You know, so that goes to the responsibility of the executive leadership team to figure out, you know, all right, what does that mean? So then that set of rules is established, and then there's a division of responsibility, and then these corporate governance structures are implemented. So look down at that third block point. Yeah, board of directors, owner of corporate governance. But then the, what the board of directors does is that it, it identifies these other risk owners and says, look, here's a risk. I want you to manage it. And remember, don't management here. Let me just go back here real quick. I promise this will be the last time I do this. You know, manage the operational risk over here in our credit silo, but Please do not have uh, do not have tunnel vision and make sure that you see how that unique operational risk in the credit silo, how that impacts all of these other operational risks in the other silos. And by the way, make sure that you visit with all of the leaders on those other ones, on those other silos, because clearly, clearly you'll be able to help them out you're going to learn something about operational risk in your silo, and that's going to be helpful to others. All right, how about some dimensions? This is targets here. This is what I was talking about. So what is the risk appetite of the firm? And so once that level, what did I say? This is the number here. Once that level is established, then we can form strategic goals. So think of those as kind of targets. And then there's a structure. And so 
you know, here's the board. And then the board says something like, all right, you know what? I need all of these people to help me out. Just like Steven Spielberg said, all right, to make it look like Indiana Jones really almost gets rolled over by that boulder in the first movie, I need, and I'm going to make this up because I've never made a movie before. Steven Spielberg says, I need engineers to be able to build the thing, you know. And I need scientists to be able to put together a boulder that looks like it's, you know, weighs a thousand tons and that it would just crush Indiana Jones. And I need some athletes to be able to tell Harrison Ford, okay, when you're running away from it, you need to run this way and this way and this way. And I need uh, lighting people so that they can put the lights down and do all this to make it look uh, even more uh, hazardous. And I need, and I need, and I need. So you get the sense that boy, not only do we need a risk committee, but we probably need subcommittees on, you know, I didn't, I lie to you. I'm not, I said I was never going back, but here I am. So we need sub risk committees underneath each of these different types, each types of risks. All right. I promise you, I won't go back there again. All right. I think it was in this, uh, one of these recent chapters where we decided that um, the board gets to pick how the firm is going to handle or manage each of those risks once they are identified. And so this is all part of, you know, I say uh, identify the risk, quantify, quantify the risk, and then manage. This is part of the managing. You know, what What can we do? We can just accept it. We can say, hey, you know what? We can deal with it. it, it you know, here's the risk and here's the return and this is what we like. And that's based on the target risk appetite. We can transfer the risk, uh, we can lessen it or mitigate it, or we can just avoid it. But all of those strategies then have to have an underlying foundation in the culture. And so it's up to the board and then the senior leadership and then the supervisors and then all of the employees to be able to adopt this risk culture. So this is what I've learned in, in my experience is that the board has to be super communicators to be able to not only identify the appropriate risk appetite, but convince the senior executive leadership team that this is part of our risk management process. And then it flows downward. It has to flow downward. And each time it flows downward with the steps, then each group then must embrace it. You know, I liked in one of those earlier slides um, that we use the term ownership or owners. And so if the employees take ownership of a risk culture, then the battle is won because it flowed from the board all the way down to the employees. And then everybody is on the same page. And so what happens if everyone's on the same page, then as the audience, when we're sitting in the movie theater and Indiana Jones, uh, somehow escapes that uh, that rolling boulder that uh, we're relieved as the audience, but all the people responsible for that particular scene then working together, uh, they, they they made it work. And then of course, it's, it's hard for me not to think that this uh, this last dimension isn't my favorite because, you know, I, I mean, clearly I believe in identifying risk and clearly I believe in managing risk. But of course, being a math guy, one of my favorite things is to measure risk. And so how are we going to do it? Are we going to use standard deviation? Are we going to use beta? Are we going to use sensitivity analysis or scenario analysis? Are we going to use value at risk? Are we going to do mapping? Didn't we just have a really cool discussion on risk mapping in a, in a recent recording? All right, how about tactical benefits of optimizing risk management? All right, so we've got this, we've got this board who establishes the risk appetite, but then what are we doing from, you know, here's the strategic plan here. What are we doing tactically from this ERM perspective? So identify weaknesses early. I think I mentioned that when we talked about emerging risks, right? Uh, potentially dangerous concentrations. All right, I love this. And so you think about, it. you know, boy, I'm tempted to go back to the previous slide, but I'm not going to. So think of that bird's eye view. You know, we have credit here and trading here. And 
boy, at the bird's eye view, we might be able to view that over here in credit, let me just pick a number, there's 100. And over here in trading, there's 100. And then over time, that credit 100 turns into 200 or 300, and that trading turns into 50 or 20, all right? So then we have all these concentrations. Without the bird's eye view, there's no way you could identify potentially dangerous concentrations. And then do you see where this leads? I mean, this is so cool. So as this, what did I say? The credit is getting bigger and bigger, more concentrated. Trading is getting smaller and smaller. We still need that correlation coefficient between the two. Uh, diversification. We learned this, you know, way back in the very beginning. Sometimes I tell my students that you learned about diversification uh, in uh, in kindergarten because, you know, you learned about uh, adding apples and then you tried to apple, add apples and oranges and, and you couldn't really do that. But students learned that, uh, hey, I'd rather have an apple and an orange than just only apples. And then finally, to make better uh, risk retention decisions. All right, here's a good slide on this risk, risk culture. We've mentioned uh, a, a handful of these things. Look at that second block point. Yeah, how employees perceive risk, think about risk, and act toward risk. So this comes from the board. And so let's start in risk culture and let's skip over to the top right there in the green. Norms and traditions of the board and senior management. All right, so this is exactly what we've been talking about. So look at the third one here. We need to identify, write, understand, discuss. That's an important one. What I think I used the word communicate earlier, but in terms of communication, we also need you know to to visit. That's uh, that's the term that my wife has always used. Let's let's have some visiting time so that we can talk about this and understand it. Right. What that does is that leads us right down into the purple decision making. And of course, we've got individuals who are responsible, but then there's an outshoot because when you make these individual decisions that they have repercussions that spread throughout the firm. Communications, we talked about that. Look at the orange one there, learning from past failures. I, I say this to my children, I say this to my students all the time, especially those students who do poorly on a first exam. I say, look, there is no shame there's no shame in doing poorly on an exam, but there is shame in doing poorly on the second exam because you repeated the mistakes that you made in studying or lack of studying uh, on, the, on the first exam. And I was always super happy for my children uh, whenever they competed athletically when, uh, you know, when they get knocked down, uh, they, uh, they're able to get right back up. And sometimes that means physically and sometimes that means uh, that means mentally. I know that there have been times when my older son has been has played in golf tournaments and he's had a bad hole. And so, you know, he writes down the score. Let's say it's an eight on the scorecard and then moves on to the next hole. You know, so this is really what we're trying to do. Move on to the next hole and not make those same mistakes. And then look right up at the north end there, attitudes and behaviors of employees. So all of these form, you know, the foundation of a risk culture. Now, I was fascinated to read about this. Uh, the, the reading I, I was telling you earlier gives some history lessons, but it also refers to some academic studies that uh, that they make this a top priority. And so I was a little surprised that it was such a high level, and I was really gladly surprised to hear that it was such a high level. And so I love this concept that risk culture is an intangible asset. So think about where that goes over on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. Of course, the greater and the more deep and broad this risk culture is, it's an asset course, it has to be an intangible asset because what it's going to do is it's going to directly lead all the way over to the cash flow statement and it's going to generate more cash flow. So what's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. How do we do this? We find projects that generate lots of cash flows over extended time periods. And so the reading makes the comment that this risk culture is the glue. So here's part of the history lesson. Poor risk culture widely blamed for the global financial crisis. And so I think that's uh, I think that's a generous way to establish this. But, you know, I tell my students this, that the 2008 financial crisis was because there were lots of financial institutions that failed to identify the risks. They failed to quantify the risk and they failed to 
to manage these risks. Uh, here's a good example uh, about payment protection insurance. And, um, you know, it was super profitable because lots of people were able to pay their uh, right hand side of their personal balance sheets. And so it was almost like free money. And so, of course, this attracts lots and lots of other people. But then uh, then when you have free money, then you get into the uh, the fence, standing on the fence between what is ethical and what is unethical. Um, you know, you can go back and uh, you can also extend this to the 2008 financial crisis with the uh, with the selling of credit default swaps. And so, you know, just skip down to the bottom there. You know, there was this uh, uh, this uh, 38 billion pounds that were paid to these claimants as of a couple of years ago. Now look at this illustration over here. So you have individual level culture, then you have the group level culture, and then you have the enterprise level culture. And so I want you to think about it this way. You know, so here we are, we're the we're purple, right? So here's here here we are as an individual, but we don't operate a, as an island you know, we have all of our colleagues around us. So in our group level, we have our colleagues that we work on some projects together, but maybe not all projects together. And then we have a supervisor and maybe we have uh, multiple supervisors. And so that green area expands it out. So you go from purple, you know, let's say one person to group level, maybe 10 or 20 people. And then, you know, a large commercial bank might have 10 of those group level cultures, but that has to be a part of the enterprise wide level culture. And there are some examples there on the slide. All right, how do we uh, how do we go ahead and evaluate our risk culture? And so you should know this from previous um, recordings. We call these uh, risk indicators, and there are tons of risk indicators out there. But we want to identify those key risk indicators. So these should make perfect sense based on our previous discussion. So accountability that makes sense incentives and i'm a, i'm a big uh, i'm a big believer in that the best way to motivate someone you know let's say an employee is to provide them with some kind of a compensation package so that there's the carrot out there that they're moving towards that carrot. And then all of a sudden they get the carrot, they eat the carrot and they look around and everyone else is eating carrots, you know? So uh, there's gotta be a marginal cost, marginal benefit to all of these incentives. And so, you know, this is a challenge as a parent, you know, you want your children to make the right decision in their lives and so you try to figure out a way to point them in that right direction and to convince them that that's the right direction communication we talked about this uh, uh it's so critical but one of the things that the chapter does does talk about is you know communication doesn't mean that i'll say something like hey this is the way it is i want you guys to go do this and the conversation is over you know effective communication is something like this this is the uh, this is the sign of a great leader and i have seen this uh, uh, in in my school where i teach where a great leader comes in and says all right here's a risk here are the consequences of this risk and here's my solution and let me tell you why i think this is the best solution so let's work through this solution and then we'll talk about the different kind of paths. And then at the end, if you like my solution, that's awesome. Let's work together and try to figure out how we can manage these risks. But if you don't like my solution, then come up with a better one. I'm happy if you come up with a better idea than I have. And so opposing views not only should be tolerated, but they should be encouraged in a way to move to move the conversation forward. You know, if, if, uh, if I went into a meeting and my dean said something like, hey, you know what, we're gonna do this and this and this, and I raised my hand and I said, you know what, I think that stinks. And that would be the end of the conversation. I mean, really, that doesn't, that's not too helpful. So opposing views should be tolerated. And this, of course, leads into the fourth one. The tone comes from the top. So if this leader says, you know what, I think I have a really good idea, but I'm open to other kinds of thought processes in terms of how do we evaluate the 
marginal costs and marginal benefits. How do we compare risk and return? Um, what kind of systems are in place for all of us to express our views so that we arrive at the end game, you know, whatever that end game is, and that end game is established by the board, of course. Now, there's an interesting section in here that could be titled something like, you know what, there are probably things that could go wrong because after all, we're all human. We all have our emotional biases and our cognitive errors and we can bring that baggage into some of these meetings. And so what the, what the chapter talks about are manipulations of data. So risk indicators that become risk levers. And so we manipulate the results of a statistical study or we leave out some important uh, data points or, or whatever that could be. And then those are used to say something like, look, oh, I was right all along. You know, there's the lever. And so, you know, we come around to the end that, all right, my decision was the best one. It was because of these reasons over here, even, even if my reasons are not satisfactory. Uh, yes, yeah, selective risk education. So this goes back to looking at this from the bird's eye view. When you, when you see the bird's eye, you can see it all. But if we're going to educate our upper management and our supervisors and our employees, um, we need to make certain that we do it in a fair manner. We, we, need, we need to not be selectively educating certain kinds of risks. I think what I was telling you earlier about the qualities of a good leader relate to um, you know, a couple of these factors here. So what the chapter tells you, it calls it unharmonized cultural attitudes. So think about this. If I'm a good leader and I come in and I say to you, here's the risk and here's my idea to solve that risk and to manage that risk. And I say to you, hey, look, help me out. You, you have a better idea. Then what that's going to do is that's going to improve the cultural attitudes and allow individuals and maybe groups of individuals that have different cultural backgrounds and different cultural ideas and attitudes to be confident to be able to say, well, you know what? I'm, I come from over there and this is how we do it over there. And oh my gosh, all of a sudden we're all better off. And this has everything to do with the cycle, right? So we have, what do we learn? We, we learn all about the business cycle in one of, our, uh, one of our chapters. But what we need to do then is we need to understand that this risk culture is not going to have, uh, you know, an upward linear, uh, an upward slope that is a line, a linear relationship. Of course, what's going to happen is it's it's more like uh, it's more like the blob. You guys ever see that movie in the 1950s, The Blob? You know this thing that blob it comes in and it eats these cities. Boy, what a terrible movie that was. You know, but the blob, this risk culture. You know, sometimes it's going to expand and sometimes it's going to contract. And so a good leader is going to be able to say things like, "Well, you know what? We're expanding, and maybe that's a good thing here, but it's not a good thing here. So let's massage it a little bit. We're contracting. Maybe that's a good thing here. Maybe it's not a good thing here. So." Let's Let's go ahead and massage it so that we can see a process of an improvement in the cultural cycle. And then finally, you know, this one shows up all the time. I remember my, uh, my econometrics professor when I was in graduate school said something like, you know what? We just paid, I forget what it was, $50,000 for these uh, daily stock prices. And he said, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that this is accurate data. Uh, however, I'm not quite sure that it's complete data and you have to figure out, uh, you know, what the sources is. And so that's, uh, that's part of the problem. But fortunately, you know, we have machine learning, we have uh, artificial intelligence, we have all these different ways to try to figure out if the data itself it, it can be useful. Because, you know, think about it. If, if we want to analyze, um, you know, uh, commercial real estate portfolio. So let's suppose we just have 100 loans. So we can, you know, we can get out the Excel spreadsheet and we can look at those 100 loans and we can compute their value today. 
And so that's a traditional way of looking at data and we can throw some artificial intelligence software at it and say, here, go try to find something, a pattern in there to help us manage this risk. But suppose we're monitoring social media and uh, some of these businesses that, uh, to whom we have lent uh, our money, they have Facebook pages. And on their Facebook page, you know, there's a bunch of stuff and, and that stuff can relate to the quality of the assets. So how do you extract, how do you extract the valuable Facebook postings or Instagram postings? Uh, and by the way, I, I know nothing about uh, social media, but you extract them and then how do you, how do you apply them? Curse of the data. Now I'm gonna take a deep breath here because I could talk for hours and hours on scenario analysis. Um, I, I love this part of the chapter. Remember I said earlier that I love the math part here. And so, you know, think about it. What, what are we doing? In scenario analysis, we're gonna say at its base level, let's just take a commercial real estate loan. So we have, you know, we have a loan. Let's suppose we lent, uh, you know, $5 million, you know, for the construction of, you know, something over there. Maybe it's an airport, maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a dam, maybe it's, you know, whatever it is, apartment building. And so we know the value of it today is $5 million. So we can build an Excel spreadsheet that says, and here's the simplest way, what's the best case scenario and what's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario might be that in a year from now, it might be worth $8 million. The worst case scenario, a year from now, it might be worth $2 million. But then what we can do is that we can build inside of those scenario analyses, worst case and best case, what are some important factors. You know, maybe interest rates is an important factor. Maybe a leverage ratio is an important factor. And then we get into the sensitivity testing. What we can do is we can say something like, all right, we build this big old spreadsheet. And by the way, sooner or later, we're gonna realize that, boy, we, we wanna know what the worst case is and we wanna know what the best case is, but then we wanna know a bunch of those scenarios in between, maybe 10 areas, in, maybe 10 possible scenarios in between best and worst cases. And then we can build sensitivity testing into it by saying, okay, suppose inflation is uh, 2% instead of 4%. And we can change the one variable and we have that whole spreadsheet and we can see, oh, this is how one input variable change impacts the value of our, of our outstanding loan. And then at a much more powerful and strong level, we can do stress testing. We can say something like, hey, what if we have another COVID? And then that just changes the whole model. Advantages here, uh, chance to model the future based on historical data or hypothetical but plausible events. Okay, I like that. Discover potential warning signals. You know, the one that I like most about, you know, think about this scenario analysis as a big old spreadsheet, is that you can look at the spreadsheet and you can look at it as, as a timeline, right? You start with time period zero, and then you go time period one, two, three, four, five, however far you wanna go out, and each time period is a column in the spreadsheet. And you can get as detailed as you want inside of this spreadsheet. And so you can discover potential warning single signals. You can spot opportunities. You can see the complications in there. You can identify those key risks because you can say, well, let's just take my simple example that I mentioned before about inflation. And so inflation takes the path, right? And so if inflation goes like this and then somehow it goes way up here, boy, potential warning signal of a spike in inflation. And that helps us with all of these things that are listed by the check marks on this page. Yeah, what are some problems here? I mean, remember scenario analysis is not perfect. Uh, it's not complete, but what it does is it gives us Boy, a super idea about what are the possibilities, but but it's super difficult to estimate probabilities. You know, if I would have come to you and said, let's suppose I'm going back to November of 2019, and I said something to you like, uh, "Hey, what's the probability that we have a new virus that spreads so contagiously that everybody, every human on the planet, is uh, at risk?" 
you might have said, oh, point oh, 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 you know, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden, you know, we have COVID. So it's difficult to estimate probabilities. You have to worry about not only the complexity, but the simplicity of the model. Uh, what that means then is that sometimes you underestimate and sometimes you overestimate those possibilities. And then, of course, uh, historical patterns, while they are excellent estimates of what might happen in the future, they're not perfect in their timing. So, you know, we have, it's not like 2008, we had the very first financial crisis. It's not like everybody was running around saying, we've never had a financial crisis before, what do we do? You know, we took a step back and said, all right, we know that we've had these before, let's figure out the similarities and the differences. But, you know, what historical analysis does is, is impossible to give you a timing on that next one. Uh, credibility can be difficult to determine uh, because you got to worry about the model. You have to worry about the inputs to the model and you have to worry about the evaluation of the outputs to the model. And so sometimes credibility can be difficult to determine. Uh, I remember when I was at my dissertation defense and uh, when you defend your dissertation, getting a PhD in finance, it's open to the public. And so what tends to happen is that your dissertation committee is there and then all of the, the other doctoral students who are either taking their comprehensive exams or in their last part of the coursework know they're going to have to write a dissertation sooner or later. They go to these things. I mean, I went to a bunch of them before I had mine, just so just so you know what is going to happen. Uh, one of my fellow doctoral students asked me a question and I didn't understand the question. I was like, dude, wh what do you mean? Why are, why are you putting me on the spot? Um, and so I said something like, well, I'll have to get back to you on that. Or I, I don't even remember what I said. But. All right, stress testing. So I mentioned this just a few moments ago. So what are we trying to do? Let, let's, swing back to, uh, let's swing back to the bottom right of the balance sheet, but in particular of uh, financial institutions balance sheet. And what do you have? You have the tier one capital and you have the tier two and you have all that kind of stuff over there. And so what are we thinking about? We're thinking you know, primarily about the equity, right? So what is that total equity? And when we stress, when we stress our scenario analysis model, you know, whatever stress that is, you know, COVID, earthquakes, uh, World War III, uh, climate change. I mean, whatever it is, we're going to stress that thing. And our ultimate answer, our ultimate question is, what is it going to happen to equity? Is it going to switch? Is it going to reduce our equity from here to here? Boy, you didn't even see my hands move there. Or is it going to shrink it from here to here? In the first case scenario, we say, oh, we don't really care about that. But in the second case scenario, then uh, then we do. So there are a couple of an exa examples there, you know, Asia and Russia, September 11th uh, attacked. Uh, notice, notice down in the middle, the third one there, we go back to 2008. Banks were heavily criticized for only considering mild scenarios in their analysis. They didn't consider risk correlation. So this is the one thing that came out of the 2008 financial crisis that we all bet on diversification. However, when you have a financial crisis, correlations tend to move to one. <laughs> you know, all markets crash, stock markets, uh, bond markets, derivative markets, uh, depending on the direction of the derivative, and then uh, alternative investment markets, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so look down at the bottom there. Regulators wanted banks to prove, and prove, this means prove mathematically, not just come out with a, uh, a statement that says, oh, oh yeah, we think we're okay brutal realistic scenario so this is the this is the brutal realistic this is the low probability high impact events and this is what pretty much brought on the um, popularity of value at risk and expected exposures and all those things that we do in other in other chapters here inside of the frm program all right so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about some of these programs that came out of uh, the first one was, you know, kind of towards the end of the 2008 financial crisis. This was the uh, the SCAP program, and what uh, what happened was that what 
President Obama's office, you know, through through the U.S. Treasury, said something like, "All right, look, what we want to do is we want to pick, the, you know, the biggest banks out there, and we want to make sure that they have sufficient capital." And what that means is that not only do we want them to have sufficient capital now, but in the event of some future stressor, we want to be certain that they'll be able to raise funds. So if the if the equity of the balance sheet shrinks that there is available capital somewhere out there. And then, of course, so this one was through the Treasury Department. And then, of course, the congressmen and congresswomen had to get involved in the act. And so we had this Dodd-Frank Act uh, from 2010, which was a mandate for um, financial institutions that had 10 billion or more in assets to conduct uh, to conduct stress tests. So this was this was a mandate, and um, this one was for 10 billion. I think this one back here was for these were the larger banks. This was for 50 billion. I think that was the number. And so look down at those uh, that those larger block points here. So what the what these stress tests then asked us to do, and I'm guessing that most of you guys know all this. So there has to be some kind of a baseline and there has to be some kind of a huge stressor. So that's the third one there, a severely adverse event. And this could be, you know, almost anything. And so I often thought about this, you know, does it really matter if we have something like like COVID or World War Three? And I don't really know what World War Three looks like or what it might look like, but you know, you have something that's gonna impact every human on the earth. And I'm guessing that there's lots of similarities between those two kinds of stress tests. Uh, but then what uh, Dodd-Frank also asks us to do is they also ask the commercial banks to look at a major adverse event, but also then a minor one. And so they just called it adverse and severely adverse. You know, here, this is taken right out of, uh, this is taken right out of the, Dodd-Frank readings, this severely adverse scenario. So let me read some of this to you. A severely adverse scenario is not a forecast, but rather a hypothetical scenario designed to assess the strength of banking organizations and their resilience to an unfavorable economic environment. All right, so they picked a whole bunch of variables, 28 variables, 16 of which are supposed to capture the economic activity and then some other variables. You know, so uh, what we're trying to do is try to figure out how things like, well, look over on the on the right. What what do we have there? Unemployment rates, GDP, consumer price index. So these these are perfectly commonsensical macroeconomic variables that you would probably pick to throw into any kind of a stress test. And so ultimately, what 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 is this Dodd Frank trying to do? It's trying to get banks to say something like, okay, here's the size of our uh, total equity, or I'm sorry, our common stock, and you know, it's going to go like this or like this, and here's how, here's the plan. And so, do you see how everything that we've talked about inside of this slide deck leads up to this stress test? Now, of course, uh, you know, this comprehensive capital analysis and review uh, was designed to try to figure out whether or not. Uh, that about that uh, that capital on the bottom right hand side of the balance sheet was enough to handle that uh, that severe financial stop uh, financial shocks. Hmm. So this is very similar, but what it does is it targets those those larger those larger banks above uh, fifty billion. Uh, they impact this. You know, I, I'm always in favor, of course, of traditional financial statements. So. Uh, what this is supposed to do is, you know, you have the stress test and then you put together an income statement, you put together a balance sheet. But of course, of course, I'm always in favor of a cash flow statement as well. Um, it's probably a good exam question. Look at that second to last block point. Um, this comprehensive capital analysis and review is less prescriptive than what Dodd-Frank was. And it applies to an expanded range of capital action assumptions, and it's more demanding in terms of reporting. And so think about, 
you know, think about a balance sheet that looks like this versus a balance sheet that looks like this. So you got all sorts of stuff, extra stuff, extra super important stuff that's involved in there. And so here's just a couple of uh, minimum ratio requirements. Uh, this is taken right out of the reading. So, you know, I've talked about the tier one and then the tier two that include that includes a bunch of reserves and the tier two capital includes also uh, all, all that all those junior debts. Here's just a picture from uh, uh, from the end of 2021. Which is a uh, which is a summary. You know, here's some averages of uh, of what's going on with uh, with all these banks. Now, what's the relationship between this uh, this ERM and CP? Right. So, capital planning. What are we doing? We've got all sorts of plans to say something like, okay. We need to raise money on the right hand side of the balance sheet to fund stuff that we're doing over on the left hand side of the balance sheet. How, how do these two things relate to each other? And of course, the answer is that they're intertwined. I like that word better than inextricable because I don't know that I can pronounce that uh, more than one time. And so think about this this enterprise wide right this firm wide risk management strategy that we have been talking about um, what this means is that all the capital decisions that we make whether we're going to uh, issue a bond whether we're going to issue shares of stock whether we're going to target certain audiences so we raise uh, short-term capital whether it's in a certificate of deposit or just uh, you know a regular old savings account. Well, this of course has to be fully uh, informed by the entire risk culture and firm-wide risk management process that we uh, uh, that we have been talking about for the last you know how long have I been sitting here? Are we up to forty minutes by now? And so the reading does have a paragraph on these uh, contin contingent convertible bonds, which are kind of like I think of these things as kind of like, all right, so we have, we have, first of all, it's a bond, right? So it's a bond issue, but it's contingently convertible. You know, we call these cocos. And so what happens is that uh, they're convertible when a bank needs to go from, you know, a bank goes like this, and then all of a sudden it goes like this. It can convert those bonds into equity to push the uh, total equity about, about back like that. And that's really the simple form of a cocoa. Look at that very bottom sentence in the red block. Using these contingent convertible bonds this way effectively makes them a uh, risk management, risk transfer tool that can be very helpful for implementing an ERM program. So think about that. When, when we decide to raise capital, let's go ahead and issue one of these COCOs and we can use the funds right over here to do whatever we want on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, but then we can convert those to shares of stock when we need it. Well, this makes perfect sense that, uh, that we can add value to our tier one capital by capital structure planning. And that takes us through our learning objectives. And we covered all these things. Boy, I, I'm not so sure that I can identify uh, ones here that are more important than the others. But what I will say is that clearly, clearly enterprise risk management is the key part of this reading. And then it flows down to all that other stuff. So thank you for watching. Have a great day and good luck studying.